it was just another day in Christian theology in which we anticipated the dynamic lectures of the Reverend Dr. J. Cameron Carter. Near the close, close of his lecture, the questions came per usual, in our approximately 150 member class, the typical voices spoke out. Some of them began to push back against Dr. Carter's unsystematic approach to Christian theology. They didn't really like that his class started with Christology. They wanted Carter to start with the Hebrew Bible. But Carter let them know that that was the problem, that too many people started with the Hebrew Bible as if it was their own and God's personal letter to them. And so Carter said, we won't start there in this class. You were not the primary audience. And so let's start with Christology and work our ways back so you don't think you own this theology. After a few questions that day, I will never forget what happened. Carter stopped. He got a puzzling look on his face. And he began to ask questions of his interrogators, asking them why were there few being vocal and a majority being silent. Carter erected a radical boundary by stating that beginning that day and the rest of the week, that white males were not allowed to ask any more questions. Carter said, this is not your theology. And those who were not asking questions, who don't think you're good enough to ask questions, I'm going to create space for them. He said, no women have asked questions. No people of color have asked questions. No other minorities in the room had asked questions. And he said, this is just as much your theology as it is theirs. He welcomed the questions. And soon, people who had never asked questions before began to ask questions from that day and going forward. Have you ever had an interruption, an inquisitor that rattled your system? Like some of the people asking questions in Carter's Christian theology class that day, they thought that they owned the rules and the practices of theological inquiry. By their very beliefs and continuous manner of questions, they were asking Dr. Carter, who gave you the authority to approach Christian theology unsystematically? Who do you think you are messing with our theology? What I perceived that some of the students were really saying, who do you think you are, you un-Ivy League educated black man, creating a curriculum and writing a syllabus that goes against the way things have been done. You're messing with our mastery. You're messing up our order. And the word on the street is you have your own Carter problems and complaints around here. When we unlearn the plantation practices that have indoctrinated us with a belief that a black man cannot be smart enough to teach us a new way, we have a sick system in need of a just Jesus. If someone is not steeped in the establishment and asking the questions that we think they should and trying to teach us a new way to think that doesn't reflect the system that we have come to know, we think it's our job to expose their authority and remove their authority when in actuality, if we listen to the new ways of teaching and imagine new ways of being, we might come to see that we, we as a people, we as a community, are better for it. It's really hard to do the work of dismantling a sick system if we are consumed with the work of upholding it. Today's message, A Just Jesus and a Sick System Part 2, is here to remind us 
renew us and perhaps reframe the way we think at the intersection of justice and Jesus. I want to take some time to expose the sick system that's revealed through the plantation, through the plantocracy, that teaches us about its authority and its ownership. The religious leaders have taken offense to Jesus' audacious actions and teachings that fail to align with their established law, their rules, their customs. The chief priest, the elders, the scribes, the clergy, the community leaders, the counselors, the judges. Some of these are part of the Sanhedrin. They're part of the Senate. And we won't even go there. What happens when senators ask questions? That's another sermon for another time. This group is put off by the practices, and yet they are probably intimidated by Jesus' very presence. But in fairness to them, they are simply doing their jobs. Who gave you authority? Who gave you authority to come into this temple and remove people? Who gave you authority to forgive sins? Who gave you authority to permit people to pluck the grain and eat it on the Sabbath? Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Who is it? Who is it who gave you this authority? Here we are at the intersection, sort of crossroads, where gatekeepers meet. And those who are doing their jobs are simply patrolling their jurisdiction, protecting the people and policing the powers that are in opposition. They are trying to figure out why this Jesus character is hell-bent on audacious actions coupled with words that are warring. In the case of today's text, there are questions that we ask when we want to assert our authority. We find ourselves in what seems to sequentially follow Jesus driving out the sellers who were making the house of prayer a den of thieves. Jesus is not giving in to the games and gimmicks of the gatekeepers. He is not submitting himself to the proper authorities, but he is perhaps asserting that there is a new authority. Jesus is telling them the answer without really telling them the answer that they want in the way that they want it. And perhaps Jesus is thinking, with all that I have done and said, what Harold Melvin would later say, if you don't know me by now, you will never, ever, ever know me. I think about the term we heard yesterday, the mutual critical correlation which I propose is almost impossible if a dialogue partner assumes that they are the authority on the answers, on the questions and the answers, for that matter. So instead of mutual critical correlation, it becomes what I call the gangsterization of the gatekeepers. The plantation teaches us, teaches gatekeepers, to ask paternalistic and patriarchal questions. Questions that seem to get us nowhere, but simply demean the person being asked. You know, questions like, well, what was she wearing when she was assaulted? Well, did she have a previous consensual relationship with the assaulter? And sometimes we religious folks are no better like the elders in the group and the chief priest that day, we ask our own set of gatekeeping questions. What denomination did you grow up in? Who did you study Hebrew Bible under? What version of the Bible do you use? And sometimes we do this for good reasons. We ask questions. I asked my own set of questions living in a new town over this last year. As I and my husband John seek to find a worship community, I find myself asking questions and listening to people's buzzwords, how they speak about God, how they speak about their pastor, because I have my own sense of authority. You know, 
Sometimes we are the gatekeepers who assemble the hoops for others to jump through to be considered worthy. But not all gatekeeping is sinful and not all gatekeeping is anti-justice. In many arenas, we want good gatekeepers. It's difficult and necessary work, but we want people to figure out who should be given contracts, who should we endorse for office, what endeavors should we fund. We want people to examine the level of someone's craft to figure out if they can thrive in our spaces. We want people to decide if someone has the competency to run for political office. Gatekeepers are necessary. And it's not a matter of will you and I, will we be gatekeepers? Will we support gatekeepers? I think the real thing is, the real question is, it's a matter of what kind of gatekeeper will you be? What kind of gatekeeper? Will you always choose to back the authorities who have the credentials? The majority vote? Whatever the question may be in your own context. Our tendency when reading this text is to identify with Jesus when in actuality, more often than not, we are gatekeepers of the establishment. The establishment is looking for Jesus to validate their authority, to co-sign on it, and to align with it. But what do we do when Jesus does not recognize nor respond to our lawmaking, law enforcement, and lawful authority? What they did not understand, and what many of us sometimes forget, is that in following the law, clinging to interpretations, traditions, and expectations of order does not make us virtuous, and law-abiding does not always make us right. Just because it's conventional doesn't mean it's just. In most cases, obeying certain authorities when it means devaluing the authority in yourself is not right nor righteous. Denying your power and valid authorization is not always humble and judicious because in a sick system that is in need of a just Jesus, one of the most justice-minded practices we can do is to live and use our power and authority for good, to do good. And so many other times, Jesus is inviting people into the questions. Jesus provides teachings to help people understand. He uses simple stories to help people understand the complexity of the kingdom of God, and he is gracious with those who really are seeking answers and not trying to just assert and show both their authority. Jesus has a grace for the real questions. But in sick systems, on plantations, the populace gives answer and does not question, does not lead, but follows, does not ask because they have the answers, does not rebel but simply obeys. And if we ever really want to dismantle the plantation, we must begin to listen to the questions being asked. What questions are worth our responses? If someone already thinks they are the authority on something, is it really worth our time to answer questions where they're just already wanting us to answer in a certain way? It is a sick system, but there's a just Jesus who models new ways of being. Justice. At the intersection of Jesus and justice, we are invited into that intersection, and Jesus gives us the authority to invite others. That's the good news, my friends. That at the intersection of justice and Jesus, we have the authority to issue invitations. Can you imagine what it would be like if we stood in the intersection and used our authorities to issue such invitations like, this is the Lord's intersection, and he invites all to come. A responsibility of having authority, any authority, any gatekeeping authority in the arena, means we have the authority to reframe our authority and to help others reframe theirs. In this sixth system, societal value was given 
to landowners, property owners, slave owners. And a just Jesus welcomes us into an intersection that redistributes authority. This Jesus says to the powers that be that new people have to be given power and authority in order to disrupt these six systems. And the even greater news is that is that nobody owns anybody. Nobody owns justice. Nobody owns theology. Nobody owns the right way of doing church. Nobody owns justice programs or has a monopoly, monopoly on them. Nobody owns proper homiletics. It is a generous orthodoxy, and it's so generous that we can't define it, that we can't regulate it, and it requires us to remain more open than you and I are comfortable with. Nobody gets to build a wall at the intersection just because they think it's just. To attempt to claim ownership at this intersection that we talk about is to imperialize the intersection. To attempt to buy property on this intersection is, is an attempt to gentrify it. The people who need to abide in this intersection can't afford it if we're policing them for being pedestrians in an intersection where they look and sound like they may not belong. We have to reframe and redistribute and not seek to own and monopolize. We have to realize that certain authorities don't always get the questions right. And sometimes religious authorities get the questions wrong. We perceive it's our job to investigate, to interrogate, so we can get enough information to be a good spokesperson for our group. And in doing that, sometimes the system will trap us in the wrong questions. Have you ever listened to the questions of those who seem not, who seem to be the chief authorities or think they're the chief authorities, have you ever wondered why we don't ask questions that we should and sometimes ask questions that we should not? When a black woman is trying to run away from the plantation, there are so many unnecessary questions. Don't get trapped. The real question is not whether Meghan and Harry, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, should be allowed to emancipate themselves from the plantation. Maybe the real questions need to be, why aren't we interrogating our own pseudo-autocratic monarchy in this country? Maybe we should examine how we shame and blame black bodies for wanting to escape and applaud white women's bodies for falling in line, following the rules, and obeying the established authority. It's a sick system, but there is a just Jesus. The ones who are asking questions, now hear me, about how Jeffrey Epstein died. Was it a homicide? Was it a suicide? I'm not saying that those questions should not be asked, but what I am saying is that the religious authorities, instead of worrying about how he died, we need to be critiquing how he lived. How did someone have enough money to buy authorities and escape retributions for numerous, numerous injustices? In a sick system in need of a just Jesus, we have to ask the right question. Furthermore, how in hell, because only in hell is it possible for an individual to be rich enough to own and upkeep an entire private island when there is an island that is a U.S. territory that has undergone devastation since 2017 by Hurricane Maria and has been recently ravaged by earthquakes and we can't get the authorities in Washington to provide enough money for the well-being well and restoration of the people and land. It's a sick system. But I know a just Jesus. When the authorities are standing around asking questions about official documents and trying to figure out if someone meets the criteria to, be, to deserve refugee status and certain freedoms, how is it 
that we're not asking the right questions when people's families are being torn apart, when they are suffering violence here and then being sent back to suffer violence somewhere else. How is it that in the U.S. in 2019, 267,000 reported were deported? The religious authority with those gatekeeping, those of us with gatekeeping authority need to be asking, how are people living in this country being dehumanized and deported, detained in unsafe, unsanitary, and ungodly conditions? What do we do when Jesus does not even recognize nor care to respond to our lawmaking, law enforcing, and lawful authority? We're just playing games with the questions. We can't allow authorities to distract us from the real questions. There are people who are in need of opportunities to be heard. We cannot assume just because someone is in the privileged space of a seminary that they are automatically being valued and their questions are being voiced. In my research, with the struggles of black clergy women often came from the gatekeepers that they had to deal with, the gatekeepers in their respective spheres, and those who gangsterized the office of pastor and decided who could come in and who could not. In spite of all of the madness, these women were flourishing. And you know why? It's because they chose their authority. Tell us by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you that authority? They knew that their authority had been given to them and they were not basing their ministries, their competencies on lawmaking bodies, potential issuing and supervisory gatekeeping people. They were tired of answering stupid questions and they were focused on answering to the authority who called them. And as we heard yesterday in the work of Dr. Ellen Blue, that those who thrive sometimes have to go against the authorities. They have to use subversive power to create new opportunities to right wrongs and to interrupt injustice. Because if the women she spoke about had waited on the proper authorities to recognize them, to see them as equal before they created training schools and settlement houses, we just have a sicker system in need of a just Jesus. So today I close with these questions. Will your work silence the authorities and create space for unheard voices? Will your work open up possibilities for people to ask questions who really do not understand and who don't just want to hear themselves talk? Will your presence and work honor the authority of the one who called you to the good works that you are doing? Will you stand for justice? Or will your justice look like a short arc that does not bend? We must be the ones. We must be the ones to imagine new ways of gatekeeping to really believe that there is a wideness in God's mercy. Let us not work to uphold the establishment, but to dismantle injustice. Let us work for justice by asking the right questions and not being detoured by the foolish ones. We must be the ones using our authority to enact justice. We must be the ones willing to ask the questions that are going to bring about answers that change policies, legislations, leaderships, and help others to come into the intersection of where Jesus meets justice. When it's in our power, let us call out the bullies, the bosses, and the bigots. Let us do so with the authority and the boldness a holy boldness of Jesus. Because you all, there is a sick system, but there is indeed a just Jesus. Amen. <laughs>